Tonight, an Ontario police officer killed in the line of duty, a suspect charged with murder. The attack that claimed the life of a 42-year-old sergeant. Three of our officers were ambushed. A sense of security badly shaken in a small town. Emotional return to charred ruins in Alberta. My voice is wreck. We have no help. An indiscriminate path of destruction and the ongoing danger. Plus Blackberry on the big screen. A device that a lot of people were really obsessed with but don't know a lot about. A new film on the ups and downs of a Canadian smartphone giant. What do you call it? It's called a Blackberry. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Reporting tonight, Sandy Ronaldo. Good evening. Gunshots rang out in a small Ontario community early this morning, leaving one officer dead and two others wounded. The attack was described as an ambush. Sergeant Eric Mueller, an officer with the Ontario Provincial Police, for 21 years was killed in the line of duty. He is the 11th officer to die over the last year. One man was arrested and charged in the village of Bourget, east of Ottawa. And that is where CTV's Kevin Gallagher reports from tonight. A solemn procession escorts the body of Ontario Provincial Police Sergeant Eric Mueller to the coroner's office in Ottawa. A husband and father of two children with 21 years of service shot and killed on duty. Our hearts are broken as we remember Eric. He's described by his colleagues as a coach, a mentor, someone that everybody looked up to, the glue that held his shift together, the best leader that many people ever had the privilege of working for. Sergeant Mueller and two other constables were responding to an early morning 911 call reporting gunfire in a village 50 kilometers east of Ottawa. They arrived at a residence on Laval Street in Bourget, and upon arrival, three of our officers were ambushed and shot. While Mueller didn't survive, a 43-year-old officer remains in critical but stable condition at hospital. The other was treated for his injuries and released. 39-year-old Alain Bellefeuille is charged with first-degree murder and two counts of attempted murder. The violent crime targeting police comes as a shock to neighbors in the town of 1100. Really just goes to show like anything can happen anywhere. You know, you think you live in a safe community and it just takes one time for it to change. It's another devastating loss for Ontario's force. Constable Greg Pierschala was also gunned down in a surprise attack less than five months ago. 11 officers have been killed since September in Canada six alone in Ontario. It has happened far too often over the past many months across this country that we've lost police officers in the line of duty, serving their community. Police say a rifle was recovered from the scene, but forensic investigators will need more time to determine what weapon was used to kill one officer and injure two others, Sandy. CTV's Kevin Gallagher. The RCMP is testing out a technology already widely used in the United States and parts of the United Kingdom. Officers in two provinces and a territory will start wearing body cameras in an effort to answer the public calls for more accountability. CTV's Atlantic Bureau Chief, Kreisen Ashkate, reports. When I want to start recording, I'm going to double tap on the middle one. Starting next week, 60 RCMP officers from Nova Scotia, Alberta and Nunavut will be testing 300 body-worn cameras. The easy way to remember for them is, you know, seatbelt off, camera on. It will be turned on prior to arriving at any call for service, recording video and audio of police interactions with a red light indicating it is recording. Alberta recently announced that body cameras will be mandatory for all officers and similar cameras have been used by the Toronto Police Service for more than two years. That third set of eyes or that extra set of eyes on any given situation really increases accountability there. And we hope that it'll speed up um, public complaint processes. It also has a hush mode, turning off the recording light, keeping officers safe from being spotted in the dark in dangerous situations. 
There will also be times officers can temporarily obstruct a video to protect the privacy of another person or victim. They're going to capture evidence that wouldn't otherwise be captured other than by sight and then verbally in court, uh, including things the officer may do right, things the officer may do wrong. Joanne McIsaac is not convinced. It's not going to fix a system that's so deeply broken right at the root. Nearly 10 years ago, her brother Michael was shot and killed by a Durham police officer after a psychological episode related to his epilepsy. The family says it caused him to run naked through an Ontario neighbourhood while wielding a metal table leg. She thinks the more than $238 million price tag for the body cams would be better spent elsewhere. I would love to see some of that money go towards training for police officers and de-escalation and how to handle situations where people are killed by police, as my brother was. A national rollout for RCMP body cams is not expected for another 18 months. Sandy. Grayson, thank you. King Charles today expressed admiration for the first responders battling wildfires in Alberta. He sent his thoughts and prayers to those who are displaced and those who've lost houses, businesses, or properties. As CTV's Alberta Bureau Chief Bill Fortier reports, some residents who've gone home were shocked by what they saw. As more Albertans return home, their evacuation orders lifted. Many are finding home is a very different place. I'm devastated. I, my wife, I mean, I don't know. Today, Dave Horse sifted through the rubble and twisted metal that used to be his property. That's why I came back, see if I can salvage anything for my wife. Her jewelry, everything else, like everything's gone. So I don't know if I can find anything. As many come back to nothing, others still have everything. So very, very excited that we could come home, but the fear is still there. 16,000 more are still waiting to go home and hoping they still have one. The biggest evacuated town is Drayton Valley, but many smaller towns are also empty, like Fox Lake where the number of destroyed buildings, including homes, is now more than 100. What I've seen on the ground and what I've seen my people is we've been, you know, resiliency is in our blood. Fox Creek is also on evacuation order. Evacuees in nearby White Court until at least this weekend. We're safe. We're, we got food. We got a roof over our head. Canada's military has now arrived to help. 200 troops deployed to the three most concerning fires which officials believe will take months to put out. These forces will be assisting with basic firefighting, including the sustained action work that's needed to actually put the fires out. Nearly 300 firefighters have also been brought in from across North America, working with Alberta's 700. Crews trying to get the upper hand during this week's wet, cooler weather knowing it won't last. We are already seeing temperatures climbing in the province, particularly in the north. In fact, residents of this area already hit so hard have been told to be packed and ready to leave again at a moment's notice. For many, it would be the third evacuation in just two weeks. Bill Fortier, CTV News, Yellowhead County, Alberta. Wildfires along with floods and earthquakes have been identified as the biggest threats facing Canada from natural disasters. That finding from a new national risk profile released today by the federal government. It's kind of like driving down the highway. And, and this is our attempt to illuminate, to turn the lights on and illuminate further down the road so that people can anticipate hazards. Bill Blair, the Minister of Public Safety, says the goal of the disaster assessment is to help Canadians become aware of the potential risks they face and better prepare for them. A second version of the report will focus on hurricanes and extreme heat. Now, extreme heat in the form of unseasonably hot weather is expected to blanket the province of B.C. starting tomorrow. As CTV's B.C. Bureau Chief Melanie Nagy reports, there are fears the heat wave could create more flooding and spark new wildfires. With temperatures rising in B.C., the province is on high alert. It is going to be hot, unusually hot, for the month of May, and we need to prepare ourselves for that. A heat wave, one that's early for this time of year, is expected to bring unseasonably warm conditions. We're going to see lots of broken records for daytime maximums over the course of the coming days. From the north to the south, almost all regions will be hit, with some areas topping out at 38 degrees. For those living near already swollen, flooding rivers, like in the city of Grand Forks and the village of Cache Creek, the hot weather is a real worry. 
we're really hoping that the water does go down quicker than it goes up. Hoping because soaring temperatures could accelerate snowfall melt at higher elevations, causing waterways to swell and burst their banks. They tell us that there's still a little bit of snow left that uh, could have an impact on the river, so we're not letting our guard up. Another concern is that the incoming heat will drive up the wildfire risk. There are now nearly 50 burning in B.C., prompting numerous open fire bans. So it's very easy for an ignition to start a fire, and with windy conditions, they'll spread quite quickly. While the weather will be sweltering, officials say it won't be anything like the heat dome nearly two years ago, where close to 600 people died. It will not rival, you know, a midsummer heat wave, and it will absolutely not resemble what we saw in late June 2021. BC's heat wave is forecasted to last at least five days, with Sunday likely seeing the biggest spike in temperatures. Melanie Nagy, CTV News, Vancouver. Tensions are heating up over accusations of foreign interference by China in Canadian politics. A former CSIS agent testifying on Parliament Hill says it's a problem that's been around for decades. Today, I want to be very clear and I want to, pr uh, and I want to be very clear. We can prove that every federal government from Mr. Mulroney to Mr. Trudeau have been compromised by agent of the communist China. Michel Junot Katsuya says governments have repeatedly ignored the issue. Ottawa expelled a Chinese diplomat accused of threatening the family of Conservative MP Michael Chong last week. And then Beijing retaliated by expelling a Canadian diplomat. Now, the former Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan, isn't home yet. But today, the Supreme Court ordered his release, calling his arrest illegal. The opposition leader appeared in the top court two days after he was whisked away by paramilitary forces from another courtroom where he faced corruption charges. Today, Khan supporters were jubilant in contrast to the violent nationwide protests over the past few days. Well, a major shift in America's immigration policy comes into effect at midnight, and it's creating confusion and chaos at the border with Mexico. A massive crowd has gathered hoping to cross into the U.S. now that a strict pandemic measure called Title 42 is ending. CTV's Los Angeles Bureau Chief Tom Walters has more. At a shelter in El Paso, Texas, 15-year-old Camila says she dreamed of coming to the U.S. Me alegra mucho estar aquí. She and her family are among the many now fleeing Latin America to get away from violence and from poverty made worse by the pandemic. They're risking everything to come to the United States because they cannot be in their home country. But if that was already a crisis on the southern U.S. border, a change in law is adding to the chaos. A pandemic-era measure called Title 42 allowed the U.S. to deport migrants without hearing their cases. Now, as that rule expires, those who enter illegally can apply for asylum. That was expected to cause a surge, but the U.S. government says the change does not mean a better chance of getting in. I want to be very clear. Our borders are not open. In fact, while migrants can now make asylum claims, it will be even harder to qualify. And those denied will not only be deported, they will risk criminal prosecution if they enter again within five years. So there has already been a surge before the end of Title 42, and the government has launched a surge of its own. 24,000 Border Patrol agents and officers, thousands of troops, contractors, and over 1,000 asylum officers and judges to see this through. But in border cities, the migrant wave seems out of control. We all know that the immigration process is broken. In a community like El Paso or anywhere in the Rio Grande Valley, they, we cannot continue for infinity. Republicans and some Democrats say the Biden administration has mismanaged the crisis. For its part, Congress has failed in every major attempt at immigration reform since 1986. Sandy? CTV's Tom Walters. Tom, thank you. Time now for a short break, but when we come back... I think it's an incredible step forward. To us, it's been a total failure, and it's been a disappointment. A new push for culture change in Canadian sport. Plus, one celebrity bid for the Ottawa Senators is reportedly on ice.
the federal government took a, another step today towards addressing the issue of sexual misconduct in the military. Defense Minister Anita Anand announced the creation of a new fund to help victims pay for legal services. The Independent Legal Assistance Program is available to all serving members of the Canadian Armed Forces and other individuals who have experienced sexual misconduct by a CAF member. The program addresses one of 48 recommendations made by former Supreme Court Justice Louise Arbour in May 2022 in her report. Ottawa also unveiled new measures today aimed at ensuring athletes are protected from abuse. The intent is to make sports organizations more accountable for the federal funding they receive. But as CTV's Jeanvia Beauchemin reports, critics say the rules don't go far enough. Glory is an athlete. Achieving excellence in sports is supposed to be a dream come true. But stories of physical, sexual abuse, of toxic culture and cover-ups have emerged in amateur ranks. To pursue sport, represent Canada, should not mean a decision between risking our physical, mental and emotional health. This is no doubt a transformative day for sport in Canada. Today, the government unveiled its game plan to fix the broken system. We are building within Sport Canada a completely new unit that will be dedicated to compliance and accountability of national sports organizations. That unit will have the power to pull funding from organizations that don't comply with new rules. Those include athlete representation on boards of those sports organizations, a public registry for sanctioned coaches, and restricting non-disclosure agreements. And that's just a start, says the minister. Trust, greater transparency, and better communication Hearings into safe sports continue today with the testimony of Charmaine Crooks, the head of Soccer Canada. And improved conditions in all areas of our sport. When I was competing at the highest level, it was the time that I felt worst about, the worst about myself. Erin Wilson heads the National Athletes Association and says the new measures give those on the playing field a voice. I think it's an incredible step forward, especially in terms of putting athletes at the centre of this sport experience. But to Rob Kohler of advocacy group Global Athlete, it's a step backward. He says a public inquiry is crucial. We're seeing money being infused into a broken system that makes no sense. Why not have a judicial inquiry to understand where the real problems is before doing these anecdotal fixes and band-aid solutions? The Minister of Sports says an inquiry is a legitimate request but that for now it's not part of the measures taking aim at what some say is the win-at-all-cost mentality that has cost athletes too much. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Montreal. Well, despite all the hype and speculation, Canadian actor Ryan Reynolds will reportedly not be an owner of the NHL's Ottawa Senators. ESPN says the bid from Reynolds and a real estate development group is not moving forward. Monday is the deadline for offers to be submitted, and other celebrities, including The Weeknd and Snoop Dogg, are also reportedly interested. It's estimated the team may sell for as much as $1 billion. Still ahead, a hankering for some snack turned into a cakewalk. I start shaking violently. And it was a win-win situation. A safety concern has led to a recall of more than 2 million Peloton exercise bikes. A U.S. regulator says people should immediately stop using the recalled model after 13 people were injured when the seat post snapped. The company says it will provide a free repair that can be self-installed. So far, the recall only applies in the U.S., but the company says it's also talking to officials in Canada. This country's newest multimillionaire was introduced in Alberta today. Aaron Parsons of Lethbridge won the $55 million Lotto Max jackpot last month. He bought the ticket at a convenience store after going there at the request of his girlfriend to buy some cake. The 33-year-old learned of the big win a couple of days after the draw. I started shaking violently. <laughs> I, I went downstairs. I was going to tell my boss that I had to go home, but he was busy, so I told someone else. And <laughs> safe to say early retirement just hit you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've already talked to my boss. <laughs> He's okay with it. Parsons also wants to help his parents retire, and he plans to buy a new car for his girlfriend. 
The U.S. Navy SEALs are an elite military unit, but this week the U.S. Navy is also proud of its sea lions. That is Spike, who was given a treat for playing a video game by using his snout to work the controls. The Navy says Spike is the first California sea lion to complete the program designed by scientists as part of their research on cognitive enrichment for marine mammals. After the break, the story behind the story, revolutionary technology and the company behind it get the Hollywood treatment. Long before the iPhone rose to glory, the BlackBerry ruled the smartphone world. It was the brainchild of some Canadian tech nerds based in Waterloo, Ontario, at a company called Research in Motion. The mobile email device was a must-have before its fall from grace. Now a new movie delves into the details. CTV's John Venavalli Rao reports. Director Matt Johnson. At screenings, Toronto-born filmmaker and co-writer Matt Johnson is often asked about his first ever BlackBerry. And the answer is kind of funny. Not only that I never had one, I've never touched one before we started shooting this movie. The first time I ever held a BlackBerry in my hand was on set. Okay, picture a cell phone and an email machine all in one thing. But Johnson, who also plays company co-founder Doug Fregan, did know it was a success story that was... What do you call it? It's called a BlackBerry. Very Canadian. Try typing with your thumbs. I felt more people around the world should know about it. I never had a BlackBerry, um, and I didn't even know it was a Canadian company, actually, until I read this script. They call them crackberries. A cross between a dark comedy and a thriller, the film tells the wild tale. You want to be great? You need to sacrifice. And the more painful the sacrifice, the greater you'll be. Of the Canadian tech geeks who teamed up with a businessman to create the gotta-have-it mobile gadget that was eventually slayed by the iPhone. A story about Canadians really pushing the envelope um, in their field. Canadian Jay Baruchel, who had a BlackBerry up until two years ago. We've been talking here. Plays co-creator Mike Lazaridi. Most of the film was shot in Hamilton, where an old factory was made to look like the legendary BlackBerry production facilities in Waterloo. You guys have no idea how to run a company. And to make it fun to watch, the movie does take liberties with the story. The guy's a shark. And businessman Jim Balsilli is portrayed as a bit of a tyrant. And I've got to be CEO. I don't know who you think you are, but deal. Still, Balsilli joined the cast at a screening and seems to appreciate the satire. I thought it was great. I thought he handled it yeah, like he really, really well. He's you been know? a good sport. The movie's been getting rave reviews, and those behind it think just like the BlackBerry, it shows what great things can come from Canada. John Venavalli Rao, CTV News, Toronto. And that's our newscast for this Thursday. Heather Wright will be here tomorrow on the weekend. Thanks for sharing your time with us. I'm Sandy Ronaldo for Omar. All of us here at CTV News, have a good night. I'll see you Monday.